Proudly, we hail. From New York City, where the American stage begins, here is another program with a cast of outstanding players. Public service time has been made available by this station to bring you this story, as proudly we hail the United States Air Force. Our story today is entitled School for Survival, an intriguing tale of the training for survival in the case of emergencies that our Air Force plane crews undergo. Our first act curtain will rise in just a moment, but first... Ask any jet pilot, he'll tell you. Jet flying is one of the most thrilling experiences in the world. And modern jets are not only fast, they're safe and easy to fly too. And now, you can get in on this jet age as an Air Force Aviation Cadet. If you're between the ages of 19 and 26 and a half, single and a high school graduate, you may qualify. You'll receive 18 months of all-round jet training, the best in the world. It's rugged, intensive work. But if the training's hard, the rewards are well worth it. You graduate as an Air Force Lieutenant, earning more than $5,000 a year, with an unlimited future before you. You'll be a highly skilled professional, fully equipped for leadership in both military and civilian aviation. Yes, become an aviation cadet today. Visit your nearest United States Air Force recruiting station or Air Force base for complete details. And now your United States Air Force presents the proudly we hail production, School for Survival. Charming looking spot. Yeah. Mm, breathe that mountain air. A room with a view. Those hills sure have a way of standing straight up. They were all right. The scene certainly had beauty. The Sierras climbing across the sky. The air was sweet and pure. And you could see for miles. Below the mountains, the sagebrush flat spread away bleak and open. Crouched on their lip was the smudge that marked our destination. Steed Air Force Base. There were 14 of us in that truck, crew of a sleek, winged baby named Guinevere. Assigned to the Strategic Air Command, we were coming to Steed to go to school. We'd been through a lot of courses together, but this was one school whose lessons we'd better never forget. This was survival school. All right, plane commanders. All your crews in at the rear of the trucks. Pep it up. We haven't got time to waste. Oh, my, my. Isn't that boy impatient? All right, you characters. You heard what the man said. Hot to it. Fall in. Hey! Hey! Gentlemen, welcome to Steed. I think you're going to find things kind of busy here. Unfortunately, time is a commodity we don't have to waste. Plane commanders will march their crews to that building across the road where you'll draw sleeping bags. Plane commanders will then draw their billet listings from me. You'll be assigned to Area H. That's about a two-mile march down the road. Road's kind of dusty, but the walk will get the kinks out of your legs. And they tell me tents are not bad till it rains. <laughs> Oh, I thought I was in the Air Force. I think the man was right. Huh? What do you mean, Ed? Well, there's a right nice tent. Reminds me of when I was a Boy Scout. Yeah, yeah, it's cozy, isn't it? Why don't we toast some marshmallows? Oh, Shep, you and Hank got the wrong idea. Haven't you ever been camping before? Well, sure I have, and but you I don't... don't like it then, and you don't like it now. Hey, yeah. Mike. Hey, what's the scoop? Yeah, tell us all, noble sir. Well, it's like this. Uh, move those gunboats for you. Oh, come on. <laughs> Uh, I think we all better plan to hit the sack about sundown. Why huh? so? 
Because Digby, by my fine feather navigator, will be up and navigating at 0530. Oh, oh, 05. Oh, clever. Oh, God, you? you guys sound like you'd never gotten up early in your lives. Yeah, but that was to fly. Okay, Mark, so we're up. What happens then? We get three days of school training, going to lectures, learning how to take care of ourselves in rough country. Then we draw out equipment and head for those hills up there. I do declare, a regular picnic. Yeah, oh, oh, I have a suggestion to make. I suggest they start building airplanes with uh, built-in planes in them. Then, if anything goes wrong, you just fly away your built-in plane and they can eliminate this course, huh? Shall I slug him, or will you? Why don't we all take a crack uh, at oh, it? Wait, no, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> It wasn't that we weren't used to getting up at an early hour. If you're a member of a sack crew, you're used to getting up at any hour. But somehow, when 0530 rolled around and whistles began oh, shrilling and voices on. shouting... Oh, I know. Everybody out! Fall out of the double! Rise and shine! Fall out! Fall out! It was tough shaking off a heavy layer of sleep and putting on a thin layer of clothes and stumbling out into a cold gray dawn. But with many groans, sighs, and muttered maledictions, we did it. And by the time breakfast was down us, we were all beginning to wake up. It was good we were, too, because it was then they started throwing education at us right and left. Now, you may think an airman's best friend is his mother, but I got news for you. When he's down in rough terrain, it's this baby, his chute. You're going to get a lot of facts pounded into you, but you'll get this one pounded into you more than the rest. No matter what happens, hang on to your chute. <laughs> And why hang on to a parachute after it's done its job of getting you down safely? Out of the canopy, the shrouds, webbing, and metal fastenings, here's a list of the things you can make. Blankets, bedrolls, teepees, lean-tos, snares, slingshots, fish hooks, and fish lines, nets, mucklucks, eye shields, hats, scarves, puttees, insect hoods, splints, bandages, slings, packs, sails, That's why you'll hang on to your chute. Now that you know it, all you've got to do is learn how to fashion these many items from it. Although we emphasize survival procedures adapted to northern woodlands, you're also going to get a thorough briefing on surviving in the jungle, the desert, and on Arctic tundra and ice. Surprising how quickly you get the main point behind these lectures. That, should you have to bail out or crash land, there's no type of terrain or country that you can't get along in if you know what to do. Lieutenant, suppose you tell us what you've learned here this afternoon. Well, uh, that uh, if you go down in the jungle, there's no need to go hungry or thirsty. Correct. Captain, where would you find water in the jungle? Oh, you can find it in cane stalks. You can find juice and vines or the fruit of most trees. Right. Can you add anything to that? Or you can drink the blood of any animal. Ew, I'll have mine on the rocks. Oh, oh, well, if you're thirsty enough, you won't care how it's served. What about food in the jungle, Lieutenant? Well, you can uh, eat any animal with fur on it, any palm bud or flower that hasn't got a milky-colored sap. Good enough. You gentlemen are really sharp, aren't you? Oh, why, Sergeant, you're being given the honor of instructing the sharpest bomber crew in the entire Strategic Air Command. Yeah. Yeah. In one full day's time, it's amazing what you can learn and how quickly you can get into the spirit of the thing. Everybody groans and kids a lot, but underneath there isn't a man of a crew taking the training that doesn't know his life can depend upon what he learns about survival anywhere on this earth. All right, you're down in the desert. The temperature's 120. You're in command. Now, what do you do? Ration all water, ration sweat, make How everything... do you ration sweat? Wear only light clothing. If you travel, travel at night. Lie still during the day. How many quarts of water does a man need to survive in the desert? At least three a day. When's the time to make sure you got enough to last you? Before you take off. One more question. Lieutenant, is it better to stay by your plane if you've crash-landed or start hiking? Well, that would depend on where you were down in the desert. The best plan would probably be to stay close to the plane and set up signal devices with mirrors, flares, and chute panels. Now, let's leave the desert for a minute and head into the frozen... <laughs> North, east, south, or west, jungle, desert, woodland, or frozen tundra, it's the same. How to get along with what you've got. How to come out in one piece. You're not expendable. Aside from the fact that there are no expendable men in any service, it takes years of training before a SAC crew is ready for operational duty. If you go down, you've got one job. Get back. You can replace a plane. You can't replace a crew. Hey, where you guys going? Over to the display building. Yeah, such eagerness is revolting. Come along, Sonny. You might learn something. Uh, it'd be a good idea if we took the whole crew over. Hey, rouse out the rest of them, will you? Hey, what are we going to get out of going over there? 
You know how to build a deadfall, Hank, or a foot snare? Nope. But aren't they going to teach us? Can't teach us everything in three days' time. We've got to do a little figuring out ourselves. That's right. The more we can learn, the easier it'll be on us. All right, let's go learn how to spear fish. I don't like fish. I think I'll spear an elk. <laughs> Three days were never so jam-packed with information or passed so quickly. On the afternoon of the third day, you turn in your sleeping bags and draw your equipment for the problem which lies ahead. We were done with a the theory of survival. The time had come to put what we'd learned to the test. At ease, gentlemen. Well, I see you're ready to take a little walk. We won't waste time. Now, look at this map. At 2,100 hours, you'll take off in a convoy of six by sixes. You'll follow this route on the highway leading out from Reno. At Honey Lake, you'll begin to climb up these switchback roads up into this area. Here. You'll find it a place of razor-sharp ridges and narrow upland meadows, just right for your type of problem. <laughs> you'll be simulating a jump over remote and rugged terrain. So bail out of your trucks by cruise and head into the tall timber. Now, for the next 10 days, you will work your way easterly toward pickup points along this rim. You'll be carrying radios and maps. And for precise coordinates, should you need them, you'll be able to contact the base by radio every night. Now accompanying you will be your instructor. He's along the watch to evaluate, to see how you put into practice what you've learned. In charge of each crew will be the aircraft commander. Although the responsibility for all your moves will be up to him, each and every one of you will be judged on every phase of this problem. Good luck and happy hunting. It's one thing to have been trained and to have become the pilot and commander of a bomber crew. It's a responsibility you grow used to because you're in an element you know and understand thoroughly. It's backed by years of experience and there's a pride and surety in it that can't be denied. Now, after three days' training, to be thrown into an element where your knowledge is skimpy at best and to be responsible for the manner in which your crew accomplishes this mission puts the same kind of a lump in your throat you had the day you soloed. The captain of the good ship Guinevere has lost his tongue, methinks. Yeah, what's the matter, Mark? You afraid of the dark? I think it's the altitude. Man has a touch of vertigo. How much more time we got to go, Sergeant? Well, another 10 minutes should do it, sir. All right, you jokers, lend an ear. Now, let's make like this truck is a sick duck. She's not going to stay up, and we're not going to stay with her. We're bailing out over not only mountainous territory, but also enemy territory. That means we don't go stumbling through the brush like a herd of elephants. Now, everybody get out their maps. I want to pick a rendezvous point right now. You'll use no lights, and you'll stay clear of anything that looks like a road. Now you'll notice. South of Crocker Mountain, a convoy cuts west to the Grizzly Valley Road. And it's here that we bail out. Every four-tenths of a mile, there's a stake to indicate a bailout station. Ours is the fifth, and as we near it, our truck slows down. Everybody set? Right, here. Yeah. All right, now here we go. Get clear of the road and lie low till your eyes become accustomed to the darkness. Try to make the rendezvous point before 0100. Okay, let's go. Who's that off to my left? It's only me from over the sea. Okay, Shep, lie still. Anyone near you? Huh? No. no, not that I can hear or see. If it seemed dark in the truck following the road, here in the deep woods, you find it so inky black, you wonder if you've gone blind, if your eyes will ever adjust themselves so you can move without falling over everything in your path. You lie still and wait. You're in alien territory with a long way to go ahead of you. You're listening to the Proudly We Hail production, School for Survival. We'll return in just a moment for the second act. For the young man looking to his future, there's a place today in the Air Force as an aviation cadet. Climb the skies in a powerful jet. 
Be one of the best trained, best equipped young men in the world, a pilot in your United States Air Force. If you're between 19 and 26 and a half, single and can meet the other high standards, check at your local Air Force recruiting station and get all the details right away. You are listening to Proudly We Hail, and now we present the second act of School for Survival. Hanlon. Go. Campelli. Uh, that's 12 of us accounted for. Stone and Carr still missing. Want three men for guard duty. Hank, you take charge of that. Get two volunteers. Oh, yeah, yeah sure. Yeah, the rest of you bed down. We've got about two hours till dawn. We'll move out to the first light. Any questions? Okay, pleasant dreams. <laughs> Hank. Ah, uh, yes, buddy? How could you sleep on a night like this? Take your men just to the edge of the timber line. Stone and car come in, it'll be that way. Suppose they don't find us. Well, then they'll be on their own. We can't have 12 men waiting on two. <laughs> Dawn comes that day, gray and ugly. Thick packed layers of full bellied clouds had swept down from the north, snuffing up the warmth of the land and replacing it with a mean, biting wind. We were on high ground, and the cloud layer raced a few hundred feet overhead, blanketing us in, cutting off our horizon. It was a lovely day to start hiking, a lovely day to get lost, a peachy day for walking in the rain. All right, you clowns, gather around. Get them all here, Chuck. Right. Come on, boys. Hey, Eddie. Now, we're going to move out without stone or car. Our watchdog, the sergeant, is going to swing back and see if he can pick them up. At least make sure they're all right. Meantime, we're going to be on our way. Rain starts coming down hard, and we get tangled up in those clouds. We'll have to call a halt and make camp. Tinker, you and Doc will move out now as scouts. You have got the route down? Yeah. Okay, good. Now, remember... Stay off the logging roads. If it starts to pour, pick a campsite and wait for us to come up with you. Okay, hit the road. Now, I'll take the point. Ed, you're a getaway man. Now, before we leave this garden spot, let's try to get rid of all signs that we've been here. Hey, Mark. Gonna rain. What makes you think that? Really couldn't see. Must be the water running down my back. That's not rainwater, son. That's perfect. You save your wind. We've got some climbing ahead. Hey, look who's coming. Okay, hold it up. All right, hold, hold it up. up. Yeah. Take five. What's the matter, Ed? Mike, Tinker took a spill. Hurt his ankle. Broken? No, I, I don't think so. It's all swollen up, though. He can't walk on it. Sergeant Wright, Armstrong. Let's go. On a double. Hank, take charge. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Hank, get those men to building shelters on that high ground there. Right. Is it broken? A uh, bad sprain, I'd say. Sorry, Captain. That's tough luck, that's all, Tink. It doesn't look like a bad spot to make camp anyway. It looks pretty good, I say. Well hidden. The stream is just jumping with fish. And... I suppose we stop jawing and get to it before those clouds unload. Shep, you make out a guard routine. Right. We'll want sentries at all times. Ed, you go help Hank with the shelter making. Take a detail and get balsam boughs for bedding. Dig, not that we're going to be lighting many fires, but you'd better round up a good supply of wood. And get some green stuff, too. We'll need it for smoke and the meat. You know, in the morning, I'm going to make me the prettiest rabbit snare you ever did see. Why, don't tell me you don't like this delicious pemmican. I'll tell you, I'll eat my boots before I'll take on another slice of it. <laughs> it's very nutritious, boy. As so the book says. High in protein value. I'll tell you what, it's high in... Are you guys it... making out? We thought you'd gotten lost. Come in and squat a while. Smoke peace pipe. We make talk. I can't. I gotta check the rest of the herd. I'll bet old Shep's getting kind of wet. Oh, no wetter than you'll be getting. How do you make out with the radio? We got the base all right. Weather permitting, they'll be sending out a helicopter for Tinker in the morning. How's he feel? Lousy. How would you feel? Well, looks like you've got a nice home here. Keeping dry? <laughs> oh, we're just snug as bugs and rugs. Me, he big wigwam maker. Make them strong, stand against mighty wind. Yeah, I hear a mighty wind. I'll see you guys later. Hey, Mark, before you go, how about a nice piece of pemmican on me? <laughs> I wouldn't deprive you. You may get hungry before this is over. <laughs> Well, 
at least the rain has stopped. I thought I drowned last night. You do look slightly mildew. <laughs> now, what's the pitch today, Master of the Hunt? How do you smoke beef? Huh? I said, how do you smoke beef so it'll keep? Well, uh, you build a teepee out of saplings, cover it with some parachute panels, put a rack inside three or four feet off the ground, put the meat on it in strips, and... Light a smudge fire or green wood underneath. Oh, give that man a box of candy bars. And, old man, you've learned your lessons well. You're hereby in charge of the meat smoking detail. Well, Get yourself another man and go to it. Now, of all that... Uh, <laughs> Shep, you look like a good man for fish. we will put you in charge of making gill nets. Find yourself a nice bottleneck in the stream, and we'll all have trout for supper. Oh, well, that's fine. You talk to the fish about hey, it? No, you speak to them. Dig! Hey, Digby! You! We'll need a couple of men to help you and Shep. They're not kidding. Yes, sir. Dig, you're the mighty Nimrod. Get some ripcord wires and build some snares. Snares, deadfalls, and beta traps, I do declare I'll flood the area with fresh meat. Yeah, go to it. Doc, you, Gambelli, and myself will go up to the snow level and lay out some shadow signals for the helicopter. Give us a chance to see how good we are. <laughs> Glad you found them, Sergeant. Oh, they were doing all right, Captain. Thought it was better if we were all together, though. Well, how'd you find us? The rain must have pretty well covered our trail. Yeah, your footprints, but not your trail. You left other signs. Hey, that's not so good. Well, it's something you have to watch, Captain. You're not kidding. It's too bad about Airman Tinker. Well, things like that are bound to happen. Yeah, I suppose so. Well, we'll break camp in the morning. <laughs> You're the boss, sir. I'm just your shadow. One thing you've realized right from the beginning... Your instructor is a pretty unusual man. He's not only an expert woodsman, but he's a sharp judge of character. He's got the poise and intelligence to make you understand the problems you run up against and to give you a healthy attitude and medium. It's his job to appraise the survival efficiency of each crew member from the aircraft commander right on down. There's plenty of time between chores or on the fire at night for him to go over the day's action and to point out where you've done a good job or made a mess of it. Now, some of you are, I know, beginning to feel a bit low. You got a touch of mountain sickness from packing it over the mountains at this altitude. There's nothing to it. It's a common feeling. Just don't let it get you down. You're in enemy territory and you're walking out. Concentrate on that. And don't start feeling sorry for yourself. Now, tomorrow we'll be entering deep snow. It'll be rugged, but just take it slow and easy. Sergeant, maybe you'd like to tell us where we fouled up today. I was coming to that, sir. Yeah. Actually, it was your best day so far. Lieutenant... Undoubtedly, you're a good navigator in the air, but without your maps and all your paraphernalia, you've gotten us lost three times in two days. Airman Gumbelli here has been the man who's gotten you straightened out. Uh, I'm for the birds. Well, happens more often than not, sir. Now, Sergeant, uh, how long does it take you to learn not to pitch your camp in the middle of a game trail? <laughs> Each day seems to get longer. You move into deep snow, you stop, make snowshoes, flounder on, make camp in the below zero cold. You build snow huts, you watch out for frostbite. You get tired and hungry and pack sore, and the altitude works on you. Everything wears the same look around you. Snow and mountains and a wild, empty land. You notice the bearded, weary faces of your crewmen, and you figure that you must look the same. Descending a steep line of cliffs in a heavy snowstorm, you come within an ace of disaster. Make sure that rope's secure. All right, Shep, you lead off. Take it slow and keep the line around you. Yeah, right, right. Looks like a long drop on a clear day. Hey, you fella, Shep. Hey, that rope isn't secure. Huh? Lieutenant, hold on to the rock. What do you hold mean? on. Hey, oh, look out there. I can't hold on. My hands are slipping. Grab my feet, you guys, and hang me over. Hold on, Shep. Yeah. Get him, Mike. I got him. I got you. Pull us up. <laughs> When you secure a line or a rope, you secure it so it'll hold. You don't just drape it around an outcropping and hope that it'll hold. Now, you've just seen that it won't. And, uh, boys, I'm too young to grow all that fast. One morning, you wake up, and the sun is up, too. Somehow, you've reached the tenth day, and you're camped near the final ridge on the eastern flank of the training area. One last cutover ridge to climb, and you've done it. It's been a long, rough road, but there isn't a one of you who hasn't learned a whale of a lot. You've learned how to pace yourselves in rugged country, how to care for your only means of locomotion, your feet, how to use the equipment you carry, and how to improvise. You've learned a lot more about your crew, just as they've learned about each other. 
It's been a real education on every count. Remember to keep your eyes and ears open for rattlesnakes. The ridge is crawling with them. Oh, oh that's happy nice. day. Oh, rattlesnake won't hurt you? Yeah, that's right. Not if it doesn't bite Shall you. Shall we go, ladies? You'll get plenty of chance firsthand to study the habits of the lowly snake. <laughs> Mark, to your left. Look out. <whistles> Thanks, buddy. Yeah, the place is positively jumping with them. Yes, they don't know this is off limits. Hey, hey, look over there. Must be half a dozen of them on that ledge. Well, don't try to make yourself at home. Will you look at that view? See all over the world. Yeah. It's almost like being up in an aeroplane. What's that? Eh, yeah, we'll want to watch it going down. Got about 2,500 feet of cliff to wrestle with. Yeah, and let me say for the record, make sure you secure those ropes before you start. Yeah, and let me be the first to second them. So you come back to Steed, bearded, tanned, dirty, but still in all pretty pleased with yourselves. You scrub up your kits, you turn them in, grab some sack time, and then get set to hear the final verdict on your ratings. It's quite a rating, with each man and each crew being judged on leadership, morale under stress, trail discipline, living off the land, care and use of clothing and equipment. The list goes on and covers everything. Gentlemen, I congratulate you. You made it. I know some of you didn't think you would, and maybe some of you didn't much care. You didn't ask to be sent here. Didn't make you any happier when they dropped you out on the sticks in the middle of the night and told you to start running. But you kept in there plugging. And you came through and you learned something, partly about yourselves, partly about the woods. This exercise you've completed was tough. But let me remind you that the real thing can be ten times as tough. You leave Steed sitting just where it was when you came to it. But you leave it a better crew than you were when you arrived. Sure, you were sharp in the air, a smooth working, beautifully trained team. But that was your job. Now you've just gone through something together that was out of your element. And like the man said, you've not only learned how to handle yourselves in the woods, you've learned about yourselves. In the long run, it's that knowledge which can be the most important should the day ever come when you're down somewhere faced with a problem of survival. Young man, can you qualify to wear the silver wings of a pilot in the United States Air Force and fly the speedy jet planes? Well, if you're a high school graduate between 19 and 26 and a half and otherwise qualified, a visit to your nearest United States Air Force recruiting station will start you on your way to your future in flight. This has been another program on Proudly We Hail, presented transcribed in cooperation with this station. Proudly We Hail is produced by the Recruiting Publicity Center in New York for the United States Air Force Recruiting Service. This is Mark Hamilton speaking, inviting you to join us next week at this same time for another interesting story on Proudly We Hail. Proudly We Hail.